Good evening, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jesse Wheeler. I am the genealogy specialist here at the Boston Public Library, and welcome this evening to this evening's local family and his local and family history series lecture. Our, our guest speakers today are part of the Mary Eliza project. Uh, so before we get going, we have a couple items of business. First of all, me, we acknowledge that the Boston Public Library Central Library stands on land that was once a water-based ecosystem providing sustenance for the indigenous Massachusetts people and is a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. We are committed to land acknowledgements for all locations at which we operate. We reaffirm this commitment, set the context for our planning, deliberations and public engagement will take place from the spirit of welcome and respect and in our motto, free to all. This program is being recorded. Everyone will get a link to it once it's ready, uh, hopefully within a few days. And everyone will also be getting a follow-up email from me tomorrow that will have the chat transcript and the handout, which I'm also gonna put into the chat right here. So in case anyone misses anything, you don't have to worry because you will be able to access it later. So we have uh, four guests here this evening. Uh, first up, we have Marta Crilly, who is the Head of Public Services at the Burns Library at Boston College and the co-director of the Mary Eliza Project. We also have Laura Kitchings, who has worked as an archivist for various organizations in New England. She is an elected member of the American Antiquarian Society and holds master's degrees in library and information science, food studies, and history. We also have Molly Copeland, who is the manuscripts archivist in the special collections at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. She has been part of the Mary Eliza team since 2022 when she joined as a graduate research assistant while attending Simmons University. Later on, we will also be joined by Laura Prieto, she, who is a professor emerita in history from Simmons University and scholar in residence at Suffolk University where she directs the Our Bodies, Ourselves Today program. She is also one of the co-directors of the Mary Eliza project. And with that, I'm going to toss it over to Molly who will be starting us off this evening. All right, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everyone who's tuning in. We're really grateful to the Boston Public Library for the opportunity to present about the Mary Eliza project tonight. Um, throughout our presentation, uh, Laura Prieto will be dropping a few related links into the chat and we have a digital handout that we invite you to explore following the presentation. So the Mary Eliza project began in 2021 as the collaboration between the Boston City Archives and Simmons University to transcribe handwritten volumes of the general registers of women voters for the city of Boston from August to October 1920. Those were the months just following the passage of the 19th Amendment. And the transcribed data set is being made publicly available for download from the city's website as a fully searchable and sortable Excel spreadsheet. Um, and we've been able to do much of that transcription through a generous Community Preservation Act grant. The data set now includes over 50,000 transcribed entries, which is a recent and very thrilling milestone for us. The Mary Eliza Project is now an independent group and we continue to partner with the city archives. We work to analyze and visualize the data set created through the grant and to research people and places connected to the voter registers. So this includes some of the women voters themselves as we are going to share more about tonight. Um, we will also be sharing ways that you yourself can use the data set for your own research and discovery. So to start things off, I'd like to first introduce the woman we've named this project after, Mary Eliza Mahoney, who you see pictured on the screen here. Mary Eliza Mahoney was the first black woman to graduate from a nursing program in the United States. She was born in Boston's West End in 1845 and she began her career in the medical field at New England Hospital for Women and Children, which at the time was unusual in that it served both black and white patients. Mahoney's work included cleaning and cooking and other patient care that's similar to that of a nurse's age today. The hospital opened a nurse's training program in 1872 to which Mahoney applied and was accepted. And she graduated at the age of 34 in 1879, after which she became a private nurse. Next slide, please. Mahoney was an outspoken advocate for black women in nursing. Um, she was one of the co-founders of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, and she also 
um, helped host its first annual convention in Boston in 1909. She was also, or has also long been credited as one of the first women to register to vote in Boston in 1920. And so for that and for her groundbreaking career as a nurse and for her advocacy with civil rights, we wanted to honor her by naming our project after her. Next slide, please. Now there's really only one photograph um, that of Mahoney that exists. Um, and we wanted to share some of the images that come up for her when you search for her. You can see that people have done a lot to celebrate her image, um, despite there only being one photograph with all these different artistic recreations and variations of the photograph. And I thought that was a fun thing to share. Um, one of the goals of our work in uncovering these stories of Boston women through their voter registrations is to bring visibility to the great diversity of women who registered in 1920. That diversity challenges some of our long held ideas about the suffrage movement who we consider suffragists and where we look for them and their activism in history. What we see in these res registers is a racially and economically diverse group of women of all different ages who were invested in women's suffrage and exercising their right to vote. And that we believe should change how we think about the suffrage movement as a whole. Next slide. So soon into the start of our project, we in fact found Mary Liza's voter registration, which you can see on the screen here. The top um, screenshot is zoomed in on her signature. The image below shows her full entry pointed out by the yellow arrow. In 1920, she was living at 48 Warwick Street, which is located near the present day intersection of Tremont and Melnian Cass Boulevard. And she registered to vote for the first time on August 17th, 1920 at the age of 76, the very day the 19th Amendment was ratified. Between August and October of that year, over 56,000 women in Boston registered, and we've transcribed nearly that many with just a few word books to go. And I'm gonna pass it off to Marta now, who will talk more about the registers themselves. Thank you, Molly. Um, so Molly showed you what Mary Eliza Mahoney's register entry looks like. Then now we wanna show you a full page of the register. So you can see the fields that clerks filled in as they registered new women voters. So if we look at this page of the register, going left to right, the clerks entered a wide variety of information. We have date of registration, ward and precinct of residence, name, signature, address of residence, age and place of work, uh, sorry, age and place of birth, occupation and place of work, and then a column for information about one's court and date of naturalization. And that date of naturalization field is especially interesting because married women's citizenship status at this time was linked to their husband's citizenship. So this field often notes if a woman was single or married, and if she was married, it frequently has her husband's citizenship information. Um, the last column you see there is a column for change of address but it also served informally as a general notes field. So we find a lot of different information in that field. Now, something that might stand out to you that's not here is any indication of a woman's race. Um, and so to determine a woman's race, we often use census records. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. These registers not only point us towards the stories of individual women who registered, but they also give us glimpses of the administrative and logistical process of registering over 50,000 women in less than two and a half months. So sloppy handwriting and ink blots hint at the hectic pace of the registration. Tiny notes in the margins about distant male relatives reveal the ways that women's citizenship and voting rights were still tied to men. And crossed out entries point to the women who tried to register but were thwarted. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at what the registers tell us about the process of registering to vote in Boston after the 19th Amendment and what these women encountered at the registration table. Oops. Um, so the Boston women who registered to vote, uh, sorry, there we are. The Boston women who registered to vote in 1920 lived in a booming multiracial city. Um, since the late 19th century, people from around the world, as well as from the southern states, had relocated to Boston. 
by 1920, the city's population was about 748,000, which I think it's important to say is more than live in the city of Boston right now. The city was not only the largest city in Massachusetts, but also the fifth largest in the United States. And while the city's racial and ethnic demographics varied by neighborhood, the city's black population overall had grown from 1.4% in 1870 to 2.2% in 1920. And this was largely the result of the Great Migration. So this was the context in which these women went to register to vote in 1920. Um, the first woman who registered to vote in anticipation of the ratification of the 19th Amendment registered on July 30th. Um, and she was followed by several women who registered to vote in, in early and mid-August, again, before the 19th Amendment had been ratified. These women who registered in early August went to the election department at Boston City Hall to register. Uh, and here is a photo of some of those women who registered in um, a Boston Globe article from August 10th, 1920. Um, as you can see from this chart, there isn't a high volume of registrations until about mid-August, uh, which makes sense given the date of ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, according to a Boston Globe article of August 20th, the city of Boston's election department set up new neighborhood registration sites shortly after the 19th Amendment was ratified. So in the evenings, women could register until 10 p.m. at these special registration places. Each ward had its own registration site, and judging from the registers, it appears that these local registration sites were the most popular place to register, as opposed to going to register at City Hall. So here on this slide, we have a list of sites uh, by wards as well as a map of the registration location for Ward 7. Um, it was at a booth in a vacant lot at Trinity Place and Stewart Street. So it was in this vacant lot that you can see next to Copley Plaza Hotel. That's where the woman in this Back Bay neighborhood would have registered. Um, and when we think about this, we can imagine lines of women chatting with their neighbors as they waited to register to vote. These lines were made up of all sorts of women, not just women born in Massachusetts or Boston, but women born in Eastern Europe, in Ireland, the Caribbean, the American South, and more. Then you would have heard women talking to their neighbors in a wide variety of languages, not just English, but Yiddish, Spanish, Dutch, Polish, a, a wide variety of languages. Some women were coming uh, to vote after a long day of factory work. Others were coming after a day spent raising children and keeping their homes running. There was a wide variety of occupations um, in these lines as well. So after the 19th Amendment pass, uh, is ratified, we see a steady pace of registration in the voter registers with spikes on August 20th, which was the last day to register for the state primary, and a huge spike on, August, on October 13th, the last day to register for the 1920 presidential election. Um, on October 13th, officials estimated that over 10,000 women registered. Boston's Mayor Peters tried to intervene to keep voter registration sites open past 10 p.m., but the head of the election department refused, saying that the law required these registration sites to close at 10 p.m. on the dot. The chaos of that evening is apparent in many of the last pages of the registers, including this register from Dorchester's Ward 18. Um, though this is a Ward 18 register, we can see that women from multiple wards are registering in it at the last minute, and this huge ink blot on the page indicates a somewhat frantic situation, I think. So on October 13th, thousands of women waited in line for hours, only to have election officials turn them away at 10 p.m. The women who were turned away were keenly disappointed and sometimes angry. Um, according to the Boston Herald, 200 women at a polling location in South Boston, quote, nearly precipitated a riot as they voiced their displeasure at election officials and the supervising police officer who was turning them away. Um, this excerpt from the Boston Globe um, that I have on the screen recounts that story as well as other stories, um, including the interesting tidbit that one ward only had one clerk <laughs> registering voters on October 13th. Um, and we will share uh, links to some of these articles later uh, in the program so you can read them for yourself. Now, many of the women who were turned away on October 13th do seem to have returned later in the year to register. Um, so far, we have found over 2,000 women 
who registered in 1920 after October 13th. So many of these women were successful in claiming their right to vote. They just weren't able to do it in time to register in the 1920 presidential election. Now, getting to the polling place in time was often not enough to register to vote. Um, when women arrived at the registration table, they faced additional hurdles before they could sign their name in that register. According to a Boston Globe article, prospective voters had to show proof of American citizenship as needed and to demonstrate their literacy skills by reading lines from the state constitution. Now, what's interesting about this literacy test is that we cannot find a law that requires voters to be literate. But we do know that some women were turned away because they could not read to the clerk's satisfaction. One of those women who was barred from registering was 40-year-old Helen Russell. And um, this is the record of Helen's attempted registration in the voter registers. Helen Russell was born in Virginia in 1880. And in the 1920 U.S. Census, she was identified as Black. On October 9th, Helen lined up at the corner of Adams and Lonsdale Street in Dorchester to register to vote. But when she got to the registration table, the clerk turned her away. The register reads, refused, could not read. And you can also see that on the screen. Interestingly, when Helen was asked earlier that year by a census taker if she could read and write, she said, yes, she could read and write. So Helen's case shows that clerks were likely making individual decisions about how to apply a literacy test that was likely illegal. Helen told the census taker that she could read, but she apparently couldn't read well enough to meet this particular clerk's standard. Now in the American South, literacy tests were a particularly effective way of blocking black voters from claiming their voting rights because of the obstacles to education that many black Southerners face. In Boston, educated black women like Mary Eliza Mahoney could pass a literacy test but the tests obstructed other voters who didn't have access to education or who had physical disabilities. So not only women like Helen Russell, a Black woman from Virginia, but also newly arrived immigrants who spoke and read English as a second language, or women like Mariah Reed, a white woman born in Vermont who couldn't pass the literacy test because she was blind. The literacy test was only one obstacle that women faced when they attempted to register to vote. Another obstacle was their citizenship status. After 1907, marriage determined a woman's citizenship status. So simply put, when you married, you took your husband's citizenship. This meant that a native born American citizen could lose her citizenship if she married a foreign born unnaturalized man. Now, if her husband subsequently naturalized, she became a naturalized citizen as well. A married woman could not file for naturalization and women who married men who were ineligible for citizenship, for example, those who married Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, or other men who were racially ineligible, could not regain their U.S. citizenship. Now, this situation shifts in 1922, but in 1920, married women who sought to register to vote had to bring proof of their husband's citizenship status to the registration table, while foreign-born single women had to bring their father's papers. Now, again, like with literacy tests, the election department clerks appear to be making individual calls about who was and wasn't eligible to vote. So when we look at these registers, we see that in their efforts to claim their voting rights, women would sometimes bring the papers of what I would call an unlikely male relative. So one example we have is Annie Irwin. Annie Irwin was a single white woman born in Liverpool, England. She brought her stepfather's papers in order to successfully register to vote. Now, this was likely not legal, but we can imagine why she might have done this, right? Perhaps her father was no longer living. Perhaps he had died. Or perhaps he was still living, but he was in England, where she was born. He would never come to America and naturalize, so she would never be able to get American citizenship through him. An even more odd situation is that of Flora Kessler of Six Moore Street. Flora was born in Boston South End, and we believe she was white, though she may have been the daughter of immigrants. But she appears to have married a foreign-born man, Harry Kessler, and you can see his information um, up on the screen. But instead of producing Harry's papers, she produces Harry's stepfather's papers. This was almost certainly not legal, but the clerk accepted the papers. So Flora's right to vote apparently rested on her husband's stepfather's legal status. 
Now, the irony and injustice of this situation was not lost on suffragists. And their activism after the 19th Amendment was ratified was a key part of the Married Women's Act passage in 1922, which put in, which largely put an end to this situation. Um, so to end this section, I thought we would listen to one of those activists, Florence Lescombe, tell a story about the absurd length that some women in Boston had to go to to register because of these citizenship laws. Um, so this is a clip from Florence Lescombe's oral history, which is uh, at the Boston City Arch. There was a man, a woman, of a, an American-born woman of an old American family. And in those days, a woman's nationality was that of her husband. And this American woman had married a foreigner, so she became a foreigner. And then uh, her husband got naturalized, so she became an American again. <laughs> She was, woman was carried around from nationality to nationality like a husband's suitcase. <clears throat> and uh, when she went down to register, uh, they told her that she would ha she, this American-born woman, would have to bring down her husband's naturalization papers to be permitted to register. And the husband didn't think that women ought to vote, and he wouldn't let her have his naturalization papers. So she couldn't exercise her legal right uh, to vote. Well, it so happened that her uh, husband went off on a business trip, and he found he needed some papers uh, that were in his safe deposit box in the bank, and he sent her an authorization to go to his bank, his safe deposit box, and there she found his naturalization papers, and she grabbed them and ran down and, and got herself <laughs> registered. And it was only this, this accident of his needing those papers that she was able to exercise her legal right to vote. So we it had the law changed from saying that a woman's nationality was that of her husband to make it her own. Mm -hmm. And he could be a foreigner, but she, if she had, were an American citizen, would still maintain her American citizenship. So these voter registers show us the diversity of the Boston women who lined up to register to vote, even if obstacles, like the literacy test or a male relative's citizenship thwarted their effort. The reality of the voter registration lines differs from the way we often imagine suffragists as white upper class women. If we think of suffragists as the women who stood in line hours, who collected the naturalization papers of their male relatives, and who made efforts to pass illegal literacy tests, all to claim their right to vote, we find a much broader range of suffragists, both nationally and locally in Boston. So now, um, we are going to zoom in on some of the individual stories that the registers tell. And I'm going to start with the story of Maud Cooney Hare, who, like Mary Eliza Mahoney, was a trailblazing woman with a really intriguing story. On September 20th, 1920, Maud Cooney Hare went to a voter registration booth in her Jamaica Plain neighborhood. Um, and her entry sticks out of the register for a few reasons. So, first, the election clerk recorded her occupation as married concert pianist and author. Her occupation is eye-catching, but it also caught my eye that the clerk writes married first before her occupation. As well, Maud writes her name as Maud Cooney Hair, not Maud Hare or Maud C. Hare, as would have been much more common in 1920. As it turns out, these three components of Maud's voter registration, her occupation, her marital status, and the name that she chose to give to the clerk point to really intriguing details in Maud's story. Now this voter registration record is just one of the many records that Maud Cooney Hare left behind, documenting her life. Maud Cooney Hare was an accomplished author, pianist, and composer. who was also the founder of the famous Allied Arts Center in Boston. But while a great deal of other material, aside from this voter registration, exists about Maud Cooney Hare, her registration points to some fascinating details in her story. And so we're gonna take a closer look at some of those details and what they tell us about her. So the register notes Maud's birthplace is Galveston, Texas. 
And it states that she is 44 years old, putting her birth in the mid 1870s during reconstruction. Maud's family was well known in Texas. Both of her parents were mixed race, born to enslaved mothers and white fathers. Maud's mother was a soprano singer and piano player who performed publicly, while her father was heavily involved in reconstruction politics. Maud graduated from high school in Galveston and shortly after graduation, she journeyed to Boston where she enrolled at the New England Conservatory. Records from NEC, as well as correspondence between Maud and her father, show that this transition to Boston was really full of challenges. Um, Maud was one of only two students of color attending NEC at the time. The other was Florida Desverne, who arrived at about the same time as Maud. Shortly after they arrived, some of the white students at NEC complained about their presence in NEC housing, and the conservatory's executive committee wrote to Maud's parents suggesting that she move into off-campus housing to, quote, ensure the comfort and satisfaction of the largest number possible. Maud refused to leave the dormitory, and she had her father's full support. Maud later wrote of her decision to stay, I was subjected to many petty indignities. I insisted upon proper treatment. Now, while Maud was subjected to these indignities at NEC, she was also finding community in Boston. She was a fixture at Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin's home, and she became close friends with W.E.B. Du Bois. In fact, they were even engaged for a short period of time. Maud returns to Texas after finishing at NEC and continues to fight against segregation and discrimination. When she was scheduled to perform at the Austin Opera House and was told the performance would be segregated with Black audience members in the balcony, she canceled the performance and instead performed at a venue where audience members of all races could sit together. In the late 1890s, Maud was met with tragedy when both of her beloved parents died, and she married a doctor named J. Frank McKinley. Maud and her new husband seemed to have had profound disagreements, one of which was on the subject of passing for white. After moving to Chicago with her husband and having a daughter, Vera, Maud, her husband, and daughter show up on the Cook County census as white, um, and you can see that at the top of the screen there. This was a real contrast to Maud's activities in Boston and in Texas. Sources argue that Maud's disagreement with passing as white was a real source of contention with her husband and one of the motivating reasons behind their divorce in 1902. Though Maud initially left with her daughter Vera, she lost custody of Vera to her former husband in a very, very contentious custody battle. Her former husband won, as was typical in this time period. It was in the wake of losing both her parents and her daughter that Maud returns to Boston, probably sometime in 1903. It is after Maud returns to Boston that we start to see her works and performances popping up in archival records. Maud's voter registration says concert pianist and author, but that only scratches the surface of her activities. She was also composing music, engaging in activism, and she remarried to a man who did not expect her to pass as white or seek to curtail her activism. This is Maud's 1904 marriage certificate on the bottom of the slide, and we can notice that she records her race as colored, in contrast to the way she is listed in the 1900 census. Evidence shows that she reconnected with her Boston community upon her return, and in 1907, she joins the Niagara Movement, an organization that fought segregation. By 1913, she was performing not only in Boston, but also around the country, mostly to integrated audiences. After she claims her right to vote in 1920, we continue to see Maud performing, collaborating, and publishing prolifically. And in 1927, she founds the Allied Arts Center of Boston. And we can see her continuing friendship with W.E.D. Du Bois in this telegram inviting him to the center's third birthday. So as we can see, Maud Cooney here is not an obscure woman. <laughs> Records of her life and work have been preserved, leaving her a fairly well-documented individual. But what does her voting registration tell us about her and her experience claiming her right to vote? So I wanna go back to the details of the registration that I pointed out at the beginning. So as I mentioned, the clerk writes married before concert pianist and author. And this made me wonder about the interaction between the clerk and Maud when she registered. Did the clerk write down married as her occupation first? And did Maud correct him or instruct him to add concert pianist and author? We don't know what the interaction between Maud and the clerk was, but we can imagine the clerk making an assumption about how Maud spent her time and Maud correcting that assumption. As well, as I noted at the beginning, if we look at Maud's signature and the name she gave the clerk, 
We note that it's Maud Cooney hair, not Maud hair or Maud C hair. Going back to her marriage certificate in 1904, we see that she shed her first husband's name and took back her family name before she married William Hare. And while she is using William Hare's name in 1920, when she registers to vote, she has also explicitly kept her family name. If we look at other archival records, we can see that she is often even hyphenating her name, which was certainly not usual in this time period. So in a society where women could lose their citizenship, their property rights, and their custody rights because of marriage, it is significant that Maud chooses to keep her family name and to use it in professional, social, and in this voter registration, legal situation. Um, so I have zoomed into the story of one registration and one woman, and now I am gonna pass it back to Molly, who is going to talk about how we can use the data set to learn about groups of women and how these registries, how these registers show connections and community. Yeah, so like Marta said, we're gonna zoom out a little bit um, and look particularly at settlement houses and other examples of communal living for women in Boston in 1920. And I'm interested in sharing this topic for a few reasons. The first being that when I started transcribing these registers in 2021, I was a student living and working in Boston and it was hard not to compare my own experiences with those of other women living and working and studying in Boston a um, hundred years earlier. And I was really struck at the different kinds of housing that proliferated in 1920 that don't exist as much today. Another reason is just the availability of the data that we have now um, to tell these stories. As new voters included their places of residence as part of their registration, the data set provides some really rich information about living patterns across and within neighborhoods. And I was especially drawn to looking at where single wage earning women chose to live and the communities that formed around those spaces. As Marta explained earlier in the presentation, in the decades leading up to 1920, Boston and other Northeast cities were seeing tremendous growth in their urban populations, partly driven by immigration, but also by internal migration and an influx of laborers seeking industrial jobs, as well as work in domestic service. So we see around this time, urban centers like Boston are becoming home to increasing numbers of single wage earning women who all needed places to live. And this demand for housing for unmarried working women wasn't just an issue of housing availability or affordability, since women tended to earn less than their male counterparts, but it was also seen as a societal moral issue while these young women and also um, women of all ages really were establishing themselves in the workplace as independent citizens and living away from family, this was at odds with a concern around preserving a traditional idea of femininity um, that was limited to the domestic sphere. And in response to an anxiety around single women being unsupervised and working in the city, um, we see a variety of housing options catering to this population including lodging houses, hotels, and those like Franklin Square House in the South End, which could accommodate as many as 850 residents. Next slide, please. So this is a view of Franklin Square House. The building still stands in the South End. Um, and actually, if you follow updates on the city's blog, um, we have some posts about the Mary Eliza project, and there's one written by our team member, Arian Weeby, about Franklin Square House. Um, and I highly recommend you check it out since I'm not going to um, spend too much time on it here. But the house was founded in 1902, very much in response to this demand um, for affordable housing for women, with the vision to, quote, provide a home for working girls at moderate cost. To this date, we have found over 100 women who were living at Franklin Square House in 1920 who registered to vote, and I expect we'll continue to find more. Next slide. But where I really got interested in this topic and where I'm going to focus for the rest of my section is in Ward 5. And this ward encompassed a number of neighborhoods right in downtown. So parts of the West End, the North End, and the South Cove neighborhood what today we know as Chinatown, and is the neighborhood that connects downtown to the South End. 
And as you can imagine, in such a densely populated part of the city, as I was transcribing these registers, there were a lot of repeat addresses for apartment buildings and lodging houses. And one that drew my interest in particular was 11 Nassau Street in the South Cove neighborhood. Now today, this is part of Tufts medical complex, but in 1920, it was a very densely populated, largely working class neighborhood, and was also um, one of the more diverse immigrant neighborhoods in Boston with predominantly Italian, Syrian, and Greek residents, but also supporting communities um, of Chinese, Eastern European, and Armenian immigrants. Next slide. Now, the entry that really caught my attention was for this woman named Bertha Hazard. Hazard registered to vote on September 17th, 1920 at the age of 61. She was born in Mobile, Alabama. She was unmarried and worked as a social worker and lived at 11 Nassau Street. And between the fun name and the place of birth, I was really intrigued to learn more and happened to be very lucky in finding not one, but two obituaries for Hazard who died in 1941. And this one is from uh, the Boston Evening Transcript where she is listed as the founder and president of Hemingway House, a, um, which was quote, how a house of cooperative living for working girls and women. She was a graduate of Vassar College, a one-time trustee of the Boston Public Library, and at one point was principal of the Quincy School, a public evening school in the South Cove. And I was really interested to know more about this house with cooperative living. And I'm excited to share some of what I learned about Hemingway House, because I think it's a fascinating example um, to look at more closely because as we'll see the organization and its founder existed within a broad network of women and organizations that were active in social reform movements of the late 18 and early 1900s. Next slide. So Hemingway House on Nassau Street was actually one of several houses that were part of an organization called the Association for Independent Cooperative Living. Um, which operated in the South Cove neighborhood throughout the early 1900s. The first was opened in 1907 by Bertha Hazard and eight other women in a building on Tyler Street. And the project was funded by and named after Harriet Hemingway, a well-known philanthropist. And some of you might recognize her name as she was the co-founder of the Massachusetts Audubon Society in 1896. The first of the Association for Independent Cooperative Living Homes was located on Tyler Street, like I just said. And then as the cooperative model proved successful, two more were opened, one on Warrington Street under the direction of Caroline Driscoll and the other on Nassau Street where we find Hazard in 1920. And in an article published in the Boston Globe in 1916, um, it writes that the founders of Hemingway House were motivated, quote, not for the sake of cheap living, but because they were sick of lodging house life. However, from what I have read, it's clear from our other articles and descriptions of the home that living cooperatively was designed to lower operating costs and to make the lodging more affordable. What we can infer is that rather than employ a full staff to clean and serve meals, residents were responsible for sharing these duties. I was able to find at least one firsthand account by a resident of Hemingway House named Louisa Bosworth, who lived there under the supervision of Hazard. Bosworth moved to Boston in 1907, straight from Wellesley to work as a fellow for the Women's Educational and Industrial Union, um, where she was conducting research for a study on wages for working women in the city, which was ultimately published in 1911. Bosworth's papers are now at the Schlesinger Library in Cambridge, and I found some of her letters to her mother quoted in a book by historian Sarah Deutsch. And writing to her mother in 1907, Louisa described the house as, quote, like a tiny oasis in a big desert. And she writes that it was a grand opportunity for me of not only living cheaply and well and having an attractive home, but of living with working girls. Six months later, in May 1908, Louisa had soured a bit to her living situation and wrote to her mother again, but this time describing Hazard as, quote, so suspicious and narrow and exacting. But she also includes that her roommates um, really said to her that Hazard isn't as bad as these other lodging house supervisors that you might encounter in the city. 
Louisa ultimately left Boston after her study was published and moved to Chicago where she worked in settlement houses. And that's just one of many connections between Hemingway House and the settlement house movement. And in particular with Denison Settlement House also in the South Cove neighborhood. Next slide. So the settlement movement was a progressive era social reform movement that began in England and quickly spread to the United States in the 1890s and reaching its peak in the 1920s. The main goal of these organizations was to bring middle and upper class people into neighborhoods with poor, often immigrant communities. The expectation was that these educated upper class settlement workers would share their education, their Christian and American values, and to help alleviate poverty in these areas. Settlement houses often provided services to the neighborhood communities, things like English classes and childcare, but they also developed cultural programming and hosted social clubs for neighborhood groups and trade unions. They also acted as hubs for sociological and public health studies that were often focused on improving the living and working conditions for the residents in these neighborhoods. One of the first settlement houses in the United States was Hull House in Chicago in 1889. And Denison was founded just a few years later in Boston in 1892 in a building on Tyler Street. This building was purchased by Cornelia Warren, another prominent philanthropist, philanthropist who also provided financial backing um, in later years to Hemingway House. Unlike the settlement movement in England, women were often at the forefront of these organizations in the United States. And Denison Settlement House was the third such house created by the College Settlements Association, an organization comprised of alumni of Smith, Radcliffe, Wellesley, and other women's colleges. And I've included a clipping on this slide announcing a real estate transaction or a building on Tyler Street between College Settlements Association and the Association for Independent Cooperative Living for a symbolic $1 in 1914. And I haven't been able to truly nail down the specifics of which buildings passed between these organizations when, where the money was coming from, but it's clear that there was a lot of cooperation and mutual support between these organizations. In this map from 1922, you can also see the geographic proximity between Denison House which by that point had expanded into multiple uh, row homes and Hemingway House a few blocks away. Bertha Hazard herself was once a settlement worker. Before moving to Boston, Hazard lived and worked at Hull House in Chicago, where she co-authored a study on tuberculosis um, that was published in 1905. She presumably moved to Boston shortly thereafter to work at Denison House um, and used that as a launching pad to found Hemingway House a few years later in 1907. In 1920, we find her listed in the census as a social worker at the Animal Rescue League of Boston, yet another organization founded in the 1890s, this one by a Dorchester resident and social worker, Anna Harris Smith. Next slide. So far, we have found entries for 26 residents of 11, 11 Nassau Street, who registered to vote in 1920, which is out of the 38 residents listed in the federal census, which is pretty good turnout, all considered. And while for some living at Hemingway House was likely just a practical decision more than it was an ideological one, we also know that this cooperative house and some of its residents were part of these densely interconnected social networks within Boston and across the country. And in a busy house of working women concerned with living wages, education, animal welfare, and affordable housing, I have to imagine that women's suffrage was also a frequent topic of conversation. And I hope this example demonstrates how this data set, you can really pick a, up a thread anywhere and make some really interesting connections. And so I'd like to end my part of this presentation with trying to entice you with a topic that needs more careful research um, which is looking at the women of the Harriet Tubman Settlement House in the South End. Next slide. So as much as the stated mission of settlement houses in Boston um, was bringing together people of disparate backgrounds, in the early 1900s, this did not extend to Black Bostonians. The 
the Harriet Tubman House, um, which in 1920 was located at 25 Holyoke Street in the South End, was unique as a settlement house that was run by and for Black women. So far, we have transcribed the entries of 12 women associated with the house in the voter registers, and hopefully we will continue to find more and learn more about them. So there's always so much more to discover, and I hope this inspires you to get involved and contribute your own research to our understanding of these women and their communities. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Laura Kitchings. Thank you. I'm going to talk about how I use maps I created from the data set to explore the stories of the new women voters. I use Tableau Public, but there are many da data visualization tools available in many ways to say that word. I'm also using research from our team member, Anna Boyles, for this section. I'm starting with a map of the birthplaces of the new voters recorded in the transcribed res registries. As this map shows, the stories in the data set are not just about life in Boston in 1920, but reflect events throughout the world when these women were born and migrated to Boston. Over 6% of the women were born in Ireland. These voters include Minnie J. Lynch, there's going to be a lot of names, age 39, and Julia G. Lynch, age 34, who registered to vote on October 13th. Both Ward 24 voters were recorded next to each other in the registries. Both recorded their address as 39 Richards Avenue, and both have their father's name recorded as Patrick J. and the same naturalization information. I've assumed the two are sisters. Minnie J. Lynch's occupation was recorded as single manager, and Julia was recorded as a married housewife with her husband's name, Edward J., with no additional information. I'm curious if Julia was using her maiden name, or did she marry a man with the same last name, and did the sister live with the couple? Almost 2% of the new voters were born in what I refer to as the former Russian Empire. The map shows over 700 women born in Russia. In many cases, the transcription team found additional information in the registries that allowed the women's birthplaces to be more accurately mapped to countries such as Lithuania or Ukraine. For example, Ward 16, Sylvia Levine, age 30, 23, birth country is recorded as Russia, but her birth town was recorded as an assumed variant of Kyiv, so I mapped her birthplace to Ukraine. She is one of over 1,500 women who pre-registered to vote on August 18th. I assume that many of the women whose birthplaces are mapped to Russia were born in what is now other countries, but there were women who gave their town of birth as an identical city in what is currently Russia. Ward 19's Nettie Pritzer, age 47, was recorded as born in St. Petersburg. There is no information about when she immigrated. The only information from the registries is her husband's naturalization date of September 9th. Using family history and surprisingly leather jacket collector resources, possibly her husband's business, I found a woman I think is Nettie Pritzer, noted as born in Germany it is possible that the clerks recorded her husband's birthplace. Russian, in quotes, born women are not the only voters whose birthplaces needed to be investigated for mapping purposes. Ward 8's Bertha E. Lash, age 51, registered to vote on October 8th. Her birth country was recorded as Hungary. Notes from the transcription team allowed me to map her town to what is currently Slovakia. Roughly 1% were born in Scandinavia, 54-year-old Anna M. Morton, born in Norway, registered to vote on October 15th, right after Boston-born clerk Helen E. Morton, age 29. Both lived at 15 Rugby Road. Anna Morton's Norwegian-born husband was naturalized in 1889, roughly two years before the Boston birth of Helen. I'm assuming they are mother and daughter who registered together. The map is based on the count of records and includes some women who are unsuccessful in their attempts to register. There are two women mapped to Brazil. 25-year-old Brazil-born Ella W. Benjamin attempted to register on October 9th in Ward 19. As members of the transcription team noted, in quotes, entry incomplete and crossed out except for signature with note refused did not have any papers. The registries recorded her husband's birthplace as Russia. It is likely that she did not have her, her, his naturalization papers with her when she went to register. The 25-year-old born in Brazil, Gillette, P. Bigelow was successful when she registered to vote on October 5th. Her husband was born in Nebraska, so no issues. Next slide, please. Similar to the international map, the registers show a variety of women migrating to Boston by the 1920s from throughout the United States, as discussed before, 
You can find information relating to the Great Migration, industrialization, and other national stories that led to Boston's growth. Only 60% of the women in the transcribed registries were born in Massachusetts. Roughly 10% were born in other New England states. Connecticut-born Beatrice F. Sullivan was recorded as a 29-year-old sales lady working for William Filene Company when she registered to vote. She is registered on a page after hairdressers Agnes C. Bury and Ruth R. Hessen, both born in Massachusetts, and all three women were recorded in the same unit at East Newton Street. So I'm assuming the women were roommates and went to register together. About 6% of the voters were born in Eastern Canada. Sarah P. Skinner was a black woman from New Brunswick who registered to vote on October 11th. Her 25-year-old daughter, Portia, was a nurse in Brookline who claimed her right to vote earlier on August 20th. In the registries, Portia's place to business was recorded as a street address in Brookline. It is unclear if there was a business at that address. It appears to be a residence, but other team members have suggested she worked for a white doctor in private practice. Josephine M. James and two other voters were born in what is now the U.S. Virgin Islands. Of course, that was recorded as the Danish West Indies in the registry, but her birth island was recorded as St. Thomas. The registers did record some women who returned successfully after what appears to be an unsuccessful first attempt, and they are counted twice the map. 55-year-old Virginia-born stewardess Abby J. Jordan of Buckingham Street is listed twice on the voter registries, first on October 5th and then on October, November 10th. It can be assumed she was unsuccessful in her first registration attempt for now lost reasons. Quincy-born Elizabeth Clark was also unsuccessful when she attempted to register to vote on September 9th. Members of the transcription team noted that her entry crossed out in blue except for signature with notes, no papers. Her October 6th successful registration shows her married to a man from Newfoundland, Canada, who is naturalized in 1920. So again, we see the citizenship dependent on the husband's naturalization status. So far, women with two entries seem to be fairly rare in the transcribed registries. Um, if you note, there's 142 Georgia-born voters. I'll return to that in a bit. Next slide. As it is National Library Week, I filtered the map to show some identified librarian birthplaces from the registers. These are not all the new voters who worked in libraries. Library workers also include Ward 8 secretaries, Josephine Blackwell, who worked for the Boston Public Library, and Maude Vestigard, who worked for the State House. On a side note, one of the tricky things about working with the registries is that some clerks recorded the information in the place of business field as an actual address, while others recorded the name of the organization. For example, Ward 8's Laura F. Weeks is recorded as an assistant librarian working at 10 and a half Beacon Street, which many of us know as the location of the Boston Antonym but was at other addresses in 1920 Boston also requires more research. If you look at the center of the map, there's a dot, dark pink dot representing the birthplace of Ward 8, June Richardson Donnelly, born in the College Hill area of Cincinnati. She registered to vote on September 25th. While I did not include the key on the slide, the dark pink represents her employer as Simmons College, now Simmons University. Next slide, please. She moved to Boston in 1905, after graduating from the University of Cincinnati and the New York State Library School. She had briefly worked at the Cincinnati Public Library. She had an over 30 year career as a library science instructor at Simmons and organized the 1918 first meeting of the New England School Library Association. According to registration and research from the Simmons University archives, she was possibly a member, I'm gonna get this acronym wrong, of the Women's Educational and Industrial Union of Boston W-E-I-U. This organization was founded in Boston in 1877 for, to quote, the advancement of women and to help women and children in the industrial city. One of its causes was vocational advising for college educated women, in quotes, in fields other than teaching, no disrespect meant to teachers. Right now in the research, I've identified 16 women who possibly worked for the W-E-I-U. They include Rockport, Massachusetts born, Bertha, E. Mahoney, who registered to vote on October 13th. In 1916, through the organization, she organized the Bookshop for Boys and Girls, one of the first children's bookstores in the United States. In 1924, the Bookshop published its first newsletter that became the Horn Book Magazine, now the longest running children's literature magazine. 
well, not technically a librarian. She worked for a lending library earlier in her career and later worked with librarians here at the BPL and the New York Public Library throughout her career with the magazine. Next slide, please. Returning to the map, if you look to Eastern Canada on the map, you see a lighter pink dot representing the birthplace of Ward 6's Mary E. Prim. That pink represents the Boston Public Library. The voter registration registries record her as a 24-year-old librarian born in St. John's, Newfoundland, single and living, what was discussed earlier, the Franklin Square House. Next slide, please. Some of my favorite resources while working on this presentation were the staff publications of the Boston Public Library. In a 1921 issue of Library Life, I found that Mary E. Prim and others performed what I assume is a comic opera at a meeting. I included a picture of the courtyard from the time to help visualize the event. Librarian Esther Lister, mentioned in the same clipping as a member of the dramatic community, registered to vote on October 7th, along with over 2,800 women from across Boston. She retired from the BPL in 1960. Next slide, please. Through the Boston Li Library staff publications, I was able to follow the career of Elizabeth H. Shane, who registered to vote on August 20th, one of 5,600 women who registered on that day in Boston. Those of you who follow us on Instagram got a sneak peek of this next section. In a 1921 issue of Library Life, I learned she was working at the Codman Square Blanche, excuse me, working as part of a committee for staff instruction and active in organizing library events. In the clipping on my left on the slide, she was a member of the Massachusetts Literary Club. I appreciate that they played a game in the clipping where they had to guess the authors and titles of 10 recent popular books. Librarian Fanny Goldstein, who won the game near the bottom of the clipping, appears to have registered to vote on August 13th. Going forward in time to a different staff publication, May 1951's The Question Mark, I found a beautiful tribute chronicling McShane's career upon her retirement. The tribute was too large to fit on the slide, but discusses her career in the BPL's branch libraries, primarily in South Boston. While she was trained at Simmons as a children's librarian, she focused on adult education later in her career. The tribute highlights her 25-year tenure as a branch librarian in South Boston, including her work with the area's immigrant community, specifically her work to acquire foreign language materials for the neighborhood's Polish and Lithuanian born residents. The January 1952 issue, the bottom center clipping, reports that she plans to winter in Florida and return in the spring after her retirement. However, the May 1952 issue reports that she passed away on the trip, as you can see in her obituary from the question mark. Next slide, please. Another way I use the maps is to find stories that focus on the women from one geographic area. For this presentation, I chose Georgia. While the dots representing the new voters are hard to see on the map, you notice they are not concentrated in one location. There are some clusters in cities, but the women were born throughout the state. I included the key that lists the occupations shown on the map to demonstrate the diversity of occupations found in the registries. While new voters concentrated in some occupations, such as the over 2,000 new voters employed as stenographers. Ward 7's Juanita M. Boyd is an example. She worked as a stenographer at 222 Huntington Avenue in Boston. Uh, to do a side note about stenographers for a moment, it is one of the occupations recorded in the registries using a variety of abbreviations, so they are still being identified. There are also laundry workers, such as Roxy Lou Williams, and dressmakers, such as Georgia E. Mitchell. Next slide, please. In honor of Mary Eliza Mahoney, I filtered the map to show only nurses born in Georgia. Out of the four identified so far, city clerks recorded two at working at Plymouth Hospital, Boston, Moselle Patton and Campbell C. Clark, both single, both in their 20s, both living in Ward 13. I then used map filters, which I didn't show on the slide, to find Massachusetts born Mabel E. Tuttle also a single woman in her 20s living in Ward 13 and working at Plymouth Hospital, Boston. Campbell C. Clark and Mabel Tuttle are listed next to each other in the voter registries. They both lived at 222 Northampton Street with a number of other new voters who registered to vote on October 8th. I'm assuming the two women went together to register. 
Muzzle Patton had registered a few days earlier on October 6th with other women from her residence at 121 Warwick Street. According to WBUR, the Plymouth Hospital and Nurses Training School was founded by the Black doctor Cornelius Garland. He received his medical degree from Leonard Medical College in Raleigh, North Carolina. He began practicing in Boston in 1903 and started the school as the first and only Black hospital in Boston in 1908. It closed in 1928. In 1914, 800 patients received free care at the hospital. And unfortunately, the graduating noted nurses are not identified in this photo from a 1914 report. Slide. I want to share one last story of a Georgia born new voter for April's National Jazz Month and discuss how the voter registries show new voters as they were identified on one day of their lives. Ward 16, Sadie Williams Jackson, age 23, was recorded as a housewife when she registered to vote on October 13th. She was born to sharecroppers in Georgia and moved to Boston with her mother around age three. By 1924, she was a successful actress and jazz singer performing with her first husband, who she divorced in 1927. She performed in the United States and later went to Europe, spending significant time as a performer in Paris and Great Britain. She spent World War II in Romania, having married a wealthy Romanian man who in 1951 was arrested as a spy by the Romanian government. She petitioned the United States Embassy for a new passport and was unsuccessful. In 1956, the ACLU successfully argued her case to the Board of Immigration Appeals, and she returned to the United States, performing occasionally. She died in December of 1970 in Connecticut. These are some of the ways I've been using the maps to explore the data set. Now I'll pass it off to Marta. We'll discuss how you can use the data set for your own research. Thank you. All right, so um, as we wrap up our presentation, I am just going to share a little bit about how you can use the data set for yourself, for your own research, and some of the resources that we have come to rely on um, in our research with these materials. We really want to encourage you to use this data set um, for, for your own research, whatever that research may be. So first of all, how can you access the data set? Um, it is available, as Molly said, as an Excel spreadsheet to download from the City of Boston's website. Um, this link, which is also on our handout and which we'll also put in the chat. Um, this is what the final product looks like in Excel. It has mostly the same columns um, as the voter registers, but we have broken some down further so there's more detailed data and you can do more detailed filtering. Um, we have basic, like, so the city of Boston um, has pretty much finished transcribing this data set through the CPA grant. There's over 51,000 women in the data set right now. Um, and they are in the last stages of making sure that all of the books are there um, and doing some QCing. But this is, is really almost finished. It's in the last stages. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do a full tutorial of the spreadsheet, but just to highlight a couple of the capabilities of the data set um, and how it has been set up. So you can certainly browse the data set and read through it, just as the registers themselves. Um, were recorded and there's a lot of value to that because there's a lot of contextual information and relationships that um, are displayed by, by seeing who stood in line with who. Um, but if you were looking for a particular person or a person from a particular place, you can search the data set for specific names or terms with text searching. Or if you wanted to sort the data set either alphabetically or numerically by a particular field, um, you can do that. That can be a very useful way to sort the data. You can also use filters to sort the data. So you can filter out registrations from a particular ward, a particular street, or even a particular place of birth. Um, and since we are presenting at the Boston Public Library, even though we're virtual, I thought I would filter out the women living on Dartmouth Street who voted. Um, and here you can see some of those results. Um, and again, so this is women who lived on Dartmouth Street. And you can see we have a bunch of women living um, at the same address. Um, we can see what what date they voted on. This is a this is can be a very useful tool. Um, to aid you in our research with voter registers, we have also compiled this short list of resources that we have relied on in our own work um, that fortunately are free and accessible to the public with anyone uh, who has access to the internet. Um, and these are in our handout. 
So many of you are probably familiar with FamilySearch.org. It is a genealogy website similar to Ancestry.com. It is free to set up an account. Um, we have found this particularly useful in double checking spellings of names and places of birth um, in census and marriage records. The Boston Register and Business Directory um, is a digitized version of a printed volume, which is text searchable and available through Hadi Trust. This was published annually, and it is essentially a yellow pages of businesses, associations, schools, um, government buildings, and their addresses. Boston street books were put out periodically by the city of Boston, um, and they were very helpful in checking street names and locations. The 1919 one is available for free through the Internet Archive. Um, and then finally, ward and precinct maps are also useful in determining locations and old neighborhoods. That is especially true of parts of the city that were subject to urban renewal, um, so places that no longer exist. Um, all of these resources are included in the digital handout that we are making available. Um, and finally, we just want to plug our Instagram page. We share a lot of the research um, that we do um, through Instagram. So here is our handle. Um, Instagram is also a great way to communicate with us, to ask us questions, um, and to share your own research. Um, and we really love to hear from other people who are who are using the data set um, or who have questions about our research or who have information to add. So we would really encourage you um, to follow us and get in touch with us. So um, that concludes our presentation. Thank you so much for coming. And now we're gonna open it up for questions. Excellent, thank you everyone. So the chat box is open. If you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in there. Uh, I will start off by saying, I'm just curious, um, could you maybe talk about um, the workflow for this project? Like how many people are working on each stage, for instance? You're all still muted. <laughs> I mean, well, I can talk about the workflow as someone who has transcribed um, a lot of these words. I think maybe Marta can speak to kind of the overall workflow there. I actually don't know the number of people off the top of my head who have been a part of this project. Um, <laughs> um, but essentially, um, we have digital scans of the word books. Um, and it's really going line by line and entering that information in. Um, that can be quite laborious or it can go quite quickly. Like Marta mentioned, um, sometimes the handwriting gets really difficult to read if the clerks are writing too fast or if there were smudges, um, or sometimes you have to do a lot of research just to figure out um, what the place of birth is, um, if it's written kind of in a scribble. Um, and then we've, uh, we QC, uh, we do quality assurance on the, um, the spreadsheets that we generate from these transcriptions. Um, and those are sent to, uh, the city of Boston where they're compiled into a single data set. Yeah. And I generally, Thanks. I was just going to say after the transcription work is done, I usually get it from the Boston city archive. So I'd say same as all of you and run it through Tableau with various filters I've set up, my visualization tool. That also can take a huge amount of time or be very quick, depending on, for example, if all of the countries still exist that are in the section, or if a number of them are, for example, the Danish West Indies that needs to be mapped somewhere else. You go ahead, Laura Prieto. <laughs> Um, the wonders of group Zoom. Um, I just wanted to add uh, that that we didn't really segment off what people were doing from the beginning. In fact, the the research um, often happened alongside the transcription work, especially early at the beginning. And we also encouraged each other. We crowdsourced certain research questions among the whole group. We really worked collaboratively throughout. And I think that enriched what we were able to see, how we were able to interpret, even the handwriting was helpful uh, to do that research. And that the like thirst for storytelling as well as data visualization and mapping was there from the very beginning. Um, so it might not look really neat and efficient as far as workflow, but in terms of what it was able to allow us to, to do and to see, and also just the pure pleasure of working with all these people on this project. Um, I wouldn't have had it any other way. 
Um, and I do want to shout out to some of our other team members, um, Aaron Wiebe, Coco Lynch, and Anna Boyles. Um, we take turns presenting when we, we talk about this project, um, but they've been present throughout. Um, and we've also had um, two other um, Simmons students, um, Daniela Gilveras, and Kaz Gebhardt, um, who were part of the project for a time. Um, so it it is a living thing. Yeah, I want to yeah. echo the fact that the collaboration was really important. And then maybe also just to note, because I think this can be a little confusing, um, that this project began as a collaboration between Simmons University and the Boston City Archives when I worked at the Boston City Archives. And then as things evolved and the city archives got a community preservation act, there was a little more um, separation between the research and the transcription. Um, but we've had the wonderful experience. Everyone currently involved in the Mary Eliza, Eliza project was involved from the beginning. And a lot of our team members like Molly actually did the transcription. Um, and that I think has been really valuable because we created the data set and now we get to use it and analyze it um, and do research with it. Great, so we did, uh, we do have one question. So Thera says, I unfortunately tuned in a little late, so you probably already covered this. Did you use volunteer transcribers as well as staff? Everyone was paid and I think we are very proud of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so originally, um, through uh, seed money from Simmons University, uh, which was provided through Laura, Dr. Laura Prieto, um, and then through a Community Preservation Act. Um, and that is uh, money that comes from your tax dollars if you are a Massachusetts resident. So thank you. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we're, so... we're very we're very lucky. We were able to um to be able to pay the transcribers. Um, as Marta said, it was really important as a value to us to honor people's labor. Um, but Laura Kitchings, who I just cut off, is a volunteer, for example. Um, and at this point, Marta and I volunteer our labor on the project. So you know there there are uh some aspects of this that have not been have not been paid, but the transcription we were able to pay. And that's a high level, high level skill. Um, it's also really time consuming. Uh, if you think about over 50,000 entries that have to be interpreted and, you know, input in a, a, a conscientious manner with lots of interpretation that has to happen sometimes. Yeah, Laura, go ahead. No. No, I just want to say that um, as someone who works with the data, the fact that it is transcribed at such a high level is critical. And I think you really get that when you pay the transcribers. Wanted to chime in there. Definitely. That is pretty great that you were able to do that. So uh, one thing I noticed, uh, you were talking about some EPL related documents, which I'm actually going to put a link to in the chat for anyone who's curious. Uh, a lot of the things they were referring to are freely available in the research guide there. Uh, so just uh, touching on that a little bit, what kind of uh, what other kinds of maybe less obvious resources would you may you have used to research these women? You know, maybe like outside of census records and things like that. I can jump in with one example I used um, in the presentation is the Russian, well, in quotes, Russian born women, woman who I think was actually born in Germany. I actually found her information through a vintage leather jacket collector's website um, who wrote a article about the husband who owned a leather business and had some information in there about her, including her maiden name and the fact she was probably born in Germany, which led me to the fact I think she's recorded using her husband's information. Yeah, I will say uh, similarly, um, identifying um, locations in Eastern Europe and, and like what Lord Kitchings was talking about, um, those that were formerly part of the Russian Empire um, could be particularly hard to identify because the spellings vary so much. And so I turned to a lot of um, Jewish genealogy resources um, to identify particular cities and towns. Um, 
that really came in handy. Um, and I know we already mentioned this, but I want to really highlight it again. The Boston um, Business Register um, was super helpful because also like uh, Lauren Kitchings mentioned, um, places of uh, where people worked could sometimes just be left as um, an address. And so sometimes it, it wasn't even accompanied with an occupation. So if you wanted to get a sense of what someone did for work, you'd have to look up that um, that address to see what kind of business it was. And sometimes you realize that it was a woman who owned her own grocery um, or you know worked in a doctor's office or something like that. So, so um, yeah, also just looking at maps, <laughs> you know, um, there are some, uh, you know, funny, you know, little street corners in Boston and you can kind of get them mixed up with streets being named the same thing in different parts of the city. So um, a lot of, a lot of different things and newspapers are huge. Um, looking at historic newspapers um, is one of the best resources that I've found working with these registers. That's what I was going to say. Um, newspapers, I mean, especially the Boston Globe, um, which I believe we can access through the Boston Public Library, but otherwise you need a subscription to be able to search from home. But for the context that we often need to fill out, especially for like ordinary women who registered to vote, um, often we don't have a lot of direct information about their lives, but we can learn a lot about the surroundings, the places where they lived and worked. Um, through the Boston Globe. And also the Library of Congress has a fantastic collection of historic newspapers um, that's accessible to anyone. Uh, so for because it's not only local, it's also national and global, the lives that these women encompassed. Um, so newspapers are huge for us. I would also plug um, some resources at the Boston City Archives. Um, one resource which is not available digitally, but which is um, they can uh, help you out with remotely um, are the records of Boston public school teachers. Um, those are very easy to look up. And so if you find someone who is a Boston public school teacher, there's typically a page long history of their birthplace education and their movement through the Boston public school system. Um, another resource that you can use are the city employee list. Um, and so if you have someone who works at city hall, for example, you can find out some information um, such as when they began their job at the city, um, how much money they were making, and if they had, you can, sometimes you can kind of track backwards to see if they had worked in other departments. Those are a little bit niche, but they can be helpful. Um, and then Molly mentioned maps, and I have personally found Atlas Scope, which I think is run through the Live and Fall Map Center at BPL. That is, I have found to be a really helpful resource. We really, we love Atlas Scope over here. I love it. Uh, I, I use it a lot for reference questions. I'm also going to pop a link there. I highly recommend everyone just like, even just play around with it. It is just, if you're a map nerd at all, you'll love it. Oh, and I messed up the URL. Let me try that again. There we go. Okay, so we do have a question. So Catherine's asking, does your data on the women who lived in the settlement houses, such as Denison House, show if there was racial integration among the residents or any dominant ethnic groups? Um, so at Denison House and at a lot of the um, settlement houses, like the ones run by the College Settlements Association, the residents were typically college educated white women. Um, who were living at the settlement house and providing services to people in the neighborhood. So we don't see a lot of um, ethnic diversity among the actual like settlement workers. Um, but I do think it's, I, I did look up who, who we have who are registering to vote um, in, in the registers who were living at Denison House. And it was actually quite a small number. The house itself didn't support that many residents. Um, so there was only six. And three of them were social workers, two of them were public health nurses. Um, and the sixth was actually one of the um, earliest head workers named Helena S. Dudley, who was one of the like early founders of Denison House. And what's um, kind of a mystery with that actually, at, um, which 
I really wanted to put in the presentation, so I'm glad I got an opportunity to mention this. Um, she actually wasn't living at Denison House in the end of her life, um, but she registered there to vote in 1920. Um, she, you know, I think lived out in Warren. She wasn't really associated with Denison House anymore, so it's kind of a, a peculiar thing that she's showing up um, in 1920. But um, to answer your question, um, settlement houses with the Harriet Tubman House really being the exception were largely um, for the workers there were, were college educated and white. I do want to add that first, I don't know about Denison House particularly, but that first settlements writ large, um, that there were paid positions sometimes um, that went to women in the neighborhoods who would represent the full spectrum of like ethnic immigrants in in Boston. Um, they there were a select number um, and also that there were black settlements across the country that were run by black women, black women um, and men. And men also were settlement workers, I guess we should note, although they weren't the majority, um, that uh, there were black settlements that served black neighborhoods for the most part. And those also would have been college educated um, residents, um, mostly women and also men. Um, if you're interested in Denison House in particular, I can put a link in the chat. Um, their archival records are at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard. Um, so there's always more to learn. And I would add in that Franklin Square House was not a settlement house. So this may not pertain to your question exactly, but we do know there was at least one Black resident there in 1920, Mariah Baldwin, who our team member Aaron Wiebe has done some really wonderful research on. Um, and Mariah Baldwin, people might recognize her name because a uh, school in Cambridge, uh, she was the headmistress there and the school is now named after her. But she was um, also an early member of the Niagara movement. Um, and she was one of the women who founded the Women's Era Club. She was in these circles with Maude Pooney Hair, and I, I, I'm sure that I, I would imagine that they had some connection or knew each other. And she was at Franklin Square House in 1920. Hey, great. So we don't have any more questions right now. So I just will just close out. Is there anything that? And if you wanted to include it in your slides, but you couldn't for time, is there anything interesting that you can think of to mention that didn't fit in the presentation? I mean, honestly, for me, and you can see this on our Instagram, I think every time any of us work with the data set, we find something completely new. So it's sort of a, just a daily process of discovering interesting stories that I never knew about Boston. Um, I found myself in downtown Boston the other day walking around I was like, hey, I recognize this address from the data set. What's here now? So it's it's just a daily process of discovery, I know, for me. And I would add in there are so many things. There's so I feel like there are so many stories we could tell that we probably shouldn't start, but we do share these on our Instagram. Um, and so if this has piqued your interest, you should you should follow us and there will be more. We're hoping to eventually develop some more interpretation exhibits. We've talked about pop-up exhibits, a digital exhibit. Um, so also, if you'd like to get involved, please reach out to us. The easiest way to find us is through the Instagram messaging. But if you don't do that, um, please let us know because we have an email. Um, we could put our email address in the chat too, if somebody can multitask better than me. Um, and we'd love to hear stories of how other people use the data set as well. We do know some digital humanists and digital historians out there who have been using it. Um, maybe some some teachers out there can think about applications for their classroom teaching um, and obviously family history, local history, and just personal interest because I have to underline that idea that you know every single one of the women who lined up to claim her right to vote has a story. She has a life story behind her. And it's kind of our, our premise and it has borne out that every individual person we look at, there's something interesting about their life story that's worth sharing. So it will take us a while, even with the Instagram account to tell over 50,000 stories. Um, we could use your help. Uh, and then there's also these other ways like, like mapping um, and maybe other creative ways you can think of of working 
with the same data set for other purposes. We have uh, two more things that just came in and then we're gonna wrap up. So Eric is asking, is this project unique among American cities? Is there anything like this in New York? We're it. So they're, um, the closest thing to this project, there are a couple of projects, digital projects that looked at voter registration in the South right after the Civil War, so during the Reconstruction era, um, when Black men received the right to vote. And for a few years, we're able to exercise that vote um, after the Civil War. That's a long other story. Um, so there are, were a couple of projects like that. They don't work exactly the same way, um, but they do make data available on their websites. Um, you can contact us if you can't find them. We can hand on some links. And then Hartford, as far as like city-based, um, had a different kind of project, but also they had cards, as I recall, right? Um, where um, women's registration in 1920 went on cards and those were in the city collections, um, but it's not a publicly accessible database. It was intended for uh, an exhibit, which um, partially happened, but COVID, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic kind of got in the way of some of their plans in terms of timing. Um, so otherwise we're the only one and you can tell like how many people it takes. And even with so many of us with great skills, um, has taken us a while to go through all this. So it's really a wonderful opportunity to have this much data, um, for historians and researchers too, right. Of, um, who the women were, who were actually claiming their right to vote. Uh, we would love for other places to, who have these records, um, in existence, to launch projects like this and you know we'd be glad to consult so we hope this encourages other places to do it too yes that would be excellent so our final question so so Anne is saying she can't rem i can't remember who mentioned helen morton i knew a helen morton a vassar grad when she was working in the south end in the 1960s and onwards she was elderly then and a force for change and justice and racial integration and i don't know if she's the same helen morton so that's interesting. And that was me and actually just grabbed that quote and put it in my, in my research to find more information. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a great example that when you look at one line of the records, in this case, Helen Morton, there's a whole realm, a rabbit hole that you can just go down instantly. And so I, I love ending with this example of just how any mention in the records leads to a new research question. Definitely. Well, I think that about does it for this evening. I want to thank all of our guest speakers, uh, Marta Crowley, Laura Kitchings, Molly Copeland, and Laura Prieto for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank all of you that attended for also for joining us this evening. And just as a reminder, you'll be getting a follow-up email with a link to the handout and the chat transcript. And this was recorded, so you will all also be getting a link to the recording once it's ready. So just once again, thank you everyone for coming and I hope everyone has a good night and a good weekend. And if you follow the Boston Marathon, I hope you enjoy it on Monday. Thanks everybody. And thank you, Jesse, for inviting us to speak today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.